What's your favorite food? And how far would you go to get it? Would you move your entire household, including all your pigs, into the mountains and speak a different language just for that food? Because that's what sometimes happens here. I'm in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, a place that's fascinating in its startling diversity and unexpected uniqueness. And that goes for pretty much everything here. The nature, the landscapes, the cultures, the languages, the people. And this topic connects a bit with all of those. Meet the Karuka tree. Now this tree is one of the screw pines, a group that's unique to the Old World and Australia. You won't find it in the Americas, except maybe recently introduced as an ornamental. Now I made another video already about the screw pine family and key features of it, so you can learn more there, assuming I've uploaded it already. But some of the key features are pretty easy to see right here. First is prop roots. These basically give the tree extra support, so it doesn't need to put as much energy into making a strong trunk to hold up these odd branching patterns here. Second, the leaves are very long and narrow and have spines running along them, facing only one way, so not very touch friendly, at least if you're rubbing in the one direction. Third, you can see how the leaves here come out in kind of a twisting pattern, which is where it gets its name of screw pine. It's not actually a pine, but that's where the screw part comes from anyway. And you can see the scars from all the previous leaves also in this spiral here. And finally, like many screw pines, it has this multiple fruit which is where a bunch of flowers each produce their own smaller fruits that in the end join together into one large one. A pineapple would be another example of this. In this case, it's a pretty hefty fruit, sometimes even up to 16 kilograms with a thousand individual segments. Now this fruit is eaten regularly by more than half of the rural population here in Papua New Guinea. But what makes this fruit so special? Well, first off, it tastes pretty good. And there's a lot of different varieties too, more than 45. So some you'll have more of a sweet coconutty flavor, some you'll have more of a savory nut flavor, and that will also vary depending which part of the fruit you're eating. The shell of the seeds can be quite hard, especially on the wild Karuka species, but you can usually crack them with your hands or maybe with your teeth. But once you get inside, you get this crunchy, oily sort of flesh. To me, it tasted a lot like an oily coconut. But even if the seeds aren't developed enough to eat, the meat around them is quite edible as well. It has a firm texture, something like very firm cheese curds, and at least the one I had was a pleasant, mild, and slightly sweet taste. You can easily just eat it raw, though that wasn't historically their preferred choice, but you could do all sorts of things with it, from fried, pit roasted, smoked, boiled, or as Papa James demonstrated for me, steamed in bamboo. I was going to include the footage of that in this video, but I'm going to make a little bonus video because this video is already long enough. So it's a good skill to have being able to cook in bamboo. But you may be thinking, that's a really big fruit. How am I going to pick all the ones that are in season and use them up before they go bad? And that was a concern for the Highlanders here as well, which is why when they went to harvest these when they were in season, they would stay up in the mountains for a few weeks, moving their whole household, building new houses and everything up there. Traditionally, houses around here generally have the fireplace inside. So what they would do is harvest a lot of this karuka, and then put it in bamboo nets, hang it up in the ceiling of their house, and then just let the smoke from the fire keep insects away while it dried out up there. And of course, a dried karuka is a lot lighter than a fresh karuka, so that made it a lot easier to carry a lot of them down the mountain with you afterwards. Another thing other people did to store the karuka, though not around here that I've heard of, was to store these karuka in waterlogged dirt, and that would allow them to ferment a little bit, but otherwise keep, and so you could just take them out and cook them as if they were fresh. But either way, they take a fair bit of time to process if you're not going to use them right away. But on top of the taste, there's another reason karuka was so popular around this area. Kind of like the marita, another fruit that grows around here that I'll talk about in another video, it can t it's a very nutritious fruit, and one that contains a lot of nutrients that people's diets around here were usually lacking otherwise. See, down on the coast of Papua New Guinea, like a lot of tropical coast areas, people grew a lot of coconuts, and those provided a lot of important nutrients. But they don't grow so well at these elevations, and especially once you start to get up into the higher mountains, where temperatures might get below 10 degrees Celsius, Karuka can live with that. Coconut very much can't. And fortunately, Karuka is even quite a bit more nutritious even than coconuts. See, around here, people's diets tended to be pretty low in proteins and in fats, both things that Karuka is a fantastic source of. And so karuka could make up quite a large portion of a person's dietary protein and fat as well. 
And one of my hosts tells me it's very filling as well, but in a way that leaves you feeling energized rather than sleepy. So overall, a pretty great plant for survival. And apart from the fruit, there's a lot of other uses for this plant as well. As you might expect, the trunk and the stilts that stick out here make for pretty good timber, great for making houses and for other structures, and while you're making a house, the, the bark here works well for walls as well. The leaves with their folds are great for channeling water, so they've been put on roofs, used as rain capes, and presumably after removing the spines here. Uh, in fact, actually, before the Europeans came and in introduced new materials, this was the preferred material around here for building shelters. And back to food, the leaves were actually made into a food product as well. Salt. So to do this, the leaves would be burned into ashes, and then the ashes would be wetted and compacted, and then processed a little bit further over the next few weeks and months. And as a result, the salt was extracted from those ashes, and so you were left with salt to use. It's a pretty time-consuming process, but if your options for where you get your salt are pretty limited, you do what you got to do. Now, as well as being a plant enthusiast, I'm also kind of a linguistics enthusiast, and here you get a fascinating example of the two intersecting. The Pandanus languages, languages used specifically for these plants. Now, if you're into linguistics at all, Papua New Guinea has probably come onto your radar at some point, especially considering, despite only having like 0.3% of the world's land area and less than 0.1% of the world's population, it has more than 12% of the world's languages. Like, that's more than 800 languages. And while there are other languages in there that would be fascinating to talk about, they don't intersect so much with plant-related topics, so I digress. To my knowledge, there aren't any groups right around Garoka here that speak these languages, but if you head west towards Mount Hagen, or up into Madang, or down into the southern highlands, you will find groups that do this. Traditional New Guinean religions tend to be very animistic in their beliefs, so believing a lot of different living things to have their own spirits that could be affected by magic. So with this, there were a lot of ordinary words that were thought to be unhealthy for the Karuka plants and could potentially prevent them from developing properly. And then there were fears of certain mythical figures, especially considering these people are going quite a ways away from their normal home, way up high into these mountains that they don't normally live in. For instance, one researcher in the Mount Gilaway region noted that there was a very strong fear of a figure named Kita Meda, who is this mythical keeper of the wild dogs. And in addition to kind of controlling these dogs, he was also amazing at camouflage and could jump out at any time and kill you instantly, with or without the help of his dogs. So in an effort to control the magical properties of these higher elevations and protect themselves, and also ensure a good harvest in this place and not alert the spirits of their activities there, they changed their language, replacing old words with newer words, or perhaps with older words that meant something else before, and you could have as many as a thousand new words specifically for this language while hunting. So they're effectively speaking in code when they do this. Many of the words that got changed were words that related to this hunt for Karuka nuts, but not necessarily all of them. One linguist did an analysis of such a language amongst the Kewa people and noticed differences like this, and I'm going to need my notes for this part, for words like long leaf now meaning sugarcane, thigh now meaning firewood, fire, root, or several other things related to trees, forest meaning any winged object, and crazy, meaning any animal that isn't a dog. So some of these newer words have a strong connection with what they mean now, but others are a lot harder to tell, at least as an outsider to their culture it is. The vocabulary isn't the only part that got changed though. The grammar was also simplified a fair bit, but also modified in other ways. I don't know how to explain this part without using a lot of technical linguistic jargon, so I'll just leave a link to the source down in the description below for anyone who's interested. And on top of all this, within those taboo zones up on the mountain, you could only speak this special language. And while you were down away from the harvest, well, you didn't want those mountain spirits to hear their language being spoken and come down to investigate, so you couldn't speak it at all. And as words from this special language gradually leaked out to other people, well, now to be on the safe side, you had to replace those words with even newer words. So not only do you have the difficulty of having to learn this new language only in the zone where it's the only thing you can speak, but you also have to relearn a lot of the vocabulary every time you go back. So anyway, Pandanus languages, it's a little cultural tidbit I've always found fascinating, and I couldn't find any other videos on this subject, but this idea of taboos within Melanesian languages is quite a bit bigger than this as well.
If you're interested, the channel Native Lang has an interesting video explaining taboo systems within another language as well. So I'll link to that in the description as well. So it's a fascinating plant, this Karuka, from both a cultural and a practical standpoint. Um, but that's all I have for this week. As always, if you have any corrections, suggestions, or passing remarks, feel free to comment that down below. If you have more information, there's not a whole pile out there for this, so I'd be glad to hear that. And if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more, liking and subscribing always really helps me out. This video was made on behalf of the Garoka Natural Habitat, a place looking to preserve a slice of Papua New Guinean highland forest for education, research, enjoyment, and to teach people to cultivate honey at the same time. A huge thank you to Kelly e and I for letting me stay here and supporting this project. If you're looking for a great place to volunteer as a researcher, carpenter, teacher, beekeeper, fish pond specialist, mushroom grower, or any of other numerous other specialties, this is a great place to do it. So stick around for the next video in the Papua New Guinea Highlands here where I'll be looking at another big oily pandanus fruit, this time a brightly colored one. But anyway, until next time on Ambling with Sam.